Alright guys. So we we stopped here last time and so now let's go to this uh permutation and combination before we go to chapter uh, twenty five. So <coughs> what is the uh, permutation and combination? So actually before we go through them, here is a little bit of mess that we would need in all the problem, and that's the factorial. You probably remember what's a factorial. So a factorial of the number is, say, n plus 1 is n plus 1 multiplied by n. So basically, factorial of 4 is 4 multiplied by the factorial of 3, which is 3 multiplied by the factorial of 2, which is 2 multiplied. So basically, then the factorial of 7 is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4, all right, times 3 times 2 times 1. And so here are basically the factorial of 1 is 1, 2 is 2, 3 is 6, 4 is 24, 5 is 120, 6 is 720, 7, and you get all those numbers. You can see factorial 15, how large it gets, right? Okay, so that's the factorial, and that's the log the factorial. In case, you know, you don't want to carry all this number, you just want to write the log the factorial. And because it's so large, people actually, and it's hard to calculate that, uh, it takes time on the computer to actually calculate the factorial. We will actually come up with an approximate function to even calculate it. Right? So you see that that function is basically uh, get it pretty close, not exactly, but pretty close, and it's much faster to calculate. But anyway, that's a factorial. We will need this in our calculation. What we want to calculate? We will calculate combination and permutation of different things. Right? This is another piece of math that we need, another function that we use. So the first one was a factorial. The second one is this. It's called a binomial coefficient. When, I, when you basically have a and k, those are two numbers, 505, and we put them between brackets like this, this is what we mean. Okay? So the permutation combination that we're going to use will actually use this function. Right? So what is that function exactly? This is basically saying, you know, it's you divide over factorial of that number 5 and this number is basically repeated this time 5 times every time you take 1 so 500 for 99 for 98 for 97 for 96 right so if this is in general a and k you divide over k factorial and here this a is basically multi uh, repeated huh k time every time you take 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 all right does this make sense? The special cases is what is a and zero. I mean, I can what we should we do? And so a zero is basically one, and zero and zero is one. All right. I got confused by an example in the book of actually the one you're looking at. This one. Yes, it just has a different step in it. Right. So there are two ways to actually write this, and you will see both of them. But this is the easiest way. Right. You will see the second. The second one is probably it look like this. Right. Well, yeah. Go back up one. It's actually, it's this, we'll talk about it. So either way, whether, I actually like this because it's very clear, huh? But this is also, can be written as this. It's the same thing. What is that? This exclamation mark means factorial of n. So you're saying that thing that we did, n and k, huh? Can be written as factorial of n over factorial of k over factorial n minus k. Why would you do this if you just know that it's factorial of k and then on the top you have this n guy repeated k time every time you take one out? That's much easier to, uh, to me. But anyway, both of them work. All right? So, everyone clear what's factorial and what's the binomial coefficient? Well, so, the binomial coefficient, what is it actually, like, what, what is it? Like, what it produces a number, and that number is calculated in that way. Now, why we are using it? Yeah. Because when we try to calculate the permutation and combination that we'll talk about and what's the difference <coughs> between them, the solution will be, let's do this. Huh? When I tell you we have 500 sample, 500 students, we want to pick five students to represent us in the competition against all you, I will give you a solution in terms of something like this. And then you have to do the calculation based on this. And that would be the different combinations? So that's the different we, combinations? We, we didn't even talk about it yet. Let's, oh. We'll talk about it. But I just, I, I'm building the mess that we would need. Okay. So all I need from you now is that, you say, I'm, I'm basically, I'm trying to tell you, if I ask you to multiply two numbers, huh? You multiply them. Okay. If I ask you to come up with a binomial coefficient 505, that's how you do it. 
you divide over factorial 5 and you take this number and you repeat it 5 times every time you take 1 out that's all I'm asking while you are doing this this will come here so the first thing the combinations right so in, in permutation the order is important right the order of event is important for example I am trying to pick the first the best student in the class and the second best and the third best obviously we cannot just say here are your three no you have to tell me who's first and who's second and who's third right this guy is going to get a gold medal this guy is going to get the silver this guy is going to get the bronze so the order is important that's permutation we'll do it later the combination is we don't care about the order so in combination huh it's without regard to order so basically just give me three students we want to go and fight with the other class we just need three students to throw them into the fight it doesn't matter who are those three or like who's gonna leave the door out first those three will just go and fight with the next class and that's it all right so that that's the combination so a and b is the same as a b and a it doesn't really matter all right Okay, you have 10 children and you just want to send two of them to get the milk. So it doesn't matter whether you are sending <coughs> Brian and Adam or Adam or Brian. The fact that Adam and Brian will go, that is one solution. Huh? Alright? So, that's what I'm trying to say over here. Okay. Greg and Taylor is the same as Taylor and Greg. It doesn't really matter. So out of 47, say, population total students, we just want to pick two. To go and do something. So how many combination <coughs> we have? How many teams we can form based on this? Or, I, or basically say I have the lab, I'm teaching 4273 next uh, semester, and basically I'm telling myself I will have 20 students in the class. I would like to make groups of four. So how many possibility can I have? What, what are the, the different combination that I could make in that class? right right <laughs> and so before you say a lot before you answer you have to ask me can we repeat or we cannot repeat so in some application you cannot repeat right like for example we are sending two students to fight with the other class so i cannot send huh chain and chain doesn't work <laughs> right <laughs> So in, the, in some application, you cannot basically get two guys. Uh, uh, that same number, you cannot pick it twice. All right? But in some application, actually, you can repeat. <coughs> All right? So without repetition, it's, look at this. That's why we look at this polynomial coefficient. So without repetition, it's n k. It's exactly that function that we said how you calculate it. All right? And so that n k can be calculated the way I said, but also can be calculated from this formula. And we'll do it both way. All right? It's exactly the same result. So, for example, you say, here's the example. We have three letters, A, B, and C. We want to pick two. All right? And again, the order is not <coughs> important. So A and B is the same as B and A. That's why we are doing the combination. We are not doing the permutation. We just want to pick two numbers or two later but is a and e is an option or not if it's an option then this is repetition it's this formula if it's not an option no you cannot give me a and a and b and b that's not allowed it's only a and b or b and c or a and c then there is no repetition and we would use this so without repetition actually you know we can do it and we can check on this formula so you know that the combination we can know because it's very small but when the numbers start getting bigger you will not be able to do it in your finger. You have to use those formulas. Right? But if the problem is <coughs> three letters and you would like to pick two, of course you know that it's A and B and B and C and A and C. That's it. It should be three. And so if you check on that formula, what it should be? It should be three and two. Total is three and we would like to pick two. Without order, that's why it's combination. And without repetition, that's why we are using this formula and not that formula. Okay, this is a formula huh, without repetition. So 3 and 2, how does this work? Factorial the number at the bottom, that's factorial 2. What's the factorial 2? Two? 2. 
because it's two times one. Add the number on the top, we would repeat it how many times? Two times, because that's this guy, and every time we repeat, we take one. So start with three and then finish with two. So three times two over two, that's three, and it's uh, correct. It's only three options. Now, if we are allowed to, to have repetition, A and E, huh? and B and B and C and C, you, you see that you actually have six chances, or six com different combinations. And again, A and C is the same as C and E. That's why we are in this page. We are doing combination and not permutation. All right? So let's check on the formula and see whether this formula now, to see if it's correct or not. So this formula say that if you allow repetition in a combination, it should be N plus K minus 1 over K. N is 3, K is 2, because you are pulling 2, minus 1, and the K is 2. So 3 plus 2 minus 1, that's 4. 4 and 2, how do you do this? Factorial 2, and that number is repeated twice, and every time you take 1 out, so it's 4 and 3. So 4, 3 over 2, that's 12 over 2, that's 6. Correct. So then we trust those formulas, and we will use them for any problem. That basically say, here's a comp The only trick, however, in those problems is that no one will tell you find the combination. Or find the permutation. You have to figure out yourself that, first, is the order is important? Should I go to this page or should I go to the next page? And second, in this example, am I allowed to actually have repetition or not? That's what's really hard. But using this formula, I don't expect you to actually screw this up, right? Right? That's piece of cake. So here is an example. Again, don't look at this. Just read the statement and figure is is this is would you figure this out by yourself or not? That it's combination. The number of sample of five light bulb that can be selected from a lot of five hundred bulb is right. So he's picking five lamps and giving it to the customer. No repetition. First of all, no no order. No order, right? It doesn't really matter whether we will give him the first lamb and then the fifth lamb or the fifth. It's just basically here's the five lamb that you ask it for, right? So, so to start with, huh? There is no order. That's why we are in this section, the combination. And now the second question is: Should I pick the one without repetition or the one with repetition? Repetition means that without. So what does repetition mean that I can give him the same thing twice? Can I basically give him, here's your lamp, give it to me. Here's again this lamp, give it to me. Here, I cannot give him the same lamp five times, right? So there is no repetition. No repetition, then it's this formula, N and K. Okay? What's N 500? How many K? Five. So factorial of 500... Sorry, don't look at this. The best, the way that I like to do it is that, how do you do this? Factorial of 5, and this number is repeated 5 times, because this 5, and every time we take 1. 500, 499, 498, 497. But here is the other way to calculate this. Right? Where, where did this come from? It come from this. Huh? This is the way you do the also the binomial coefficient. It's n over k n of k, but I don't think this is really nice. I actually I think this is much easier, but they should produce exactly the same results. So the five hundred factorial. Yeah. Oh, okay, I see. I see what it is. So if if you do, then it will actually what happened is that the five hundred factorial why is different from the four hundred ninety five factorial because of those guys. Yeah. Those guys are not there in the four hundred ninety five factorial. So that's why they show up here. So rather than having factorial and factorial, you're just basically taking this guy and repeating him five times. I think that, that way it's just like to plug it into the calculator faster. Right. Right. If you, are, you are right. Joseph is right. If you're actually going to just hit the factorial number on the calculator, this would be faster. That's correct. I agree. All right. Questions about this? Or nine. So now the, the permutation is when order is important. When we basically are writing a code, for example, or writing writing a script, or you the order is important. It's not like here is a sample of our population. No, we would like really the order. So when the order is important, it makes difference who's first and who's second. 
its permutation. Alright? So the first, we have a few of those guys. So the first one is the number of mutation of n different things taken all at a time. Right? At the same time, correct. At the same time. So basically, I'm telling you, use 63 students in the class, and we want to arrange them in a line. What is, uh, how many possibility, how many time, or how, what are the number of possibility that we could have? So now the order is important, we are arranging them. Should we put uh, Robert first, or should we put uh, Kenny first? The difference, huh? It's different order. So those are not combination. Those are permutation. Alright? So now, uh, how I'm gonna, basically, if you are designing a new game, for example, huh, and you have, you remember Mastermind? Did you ever play that when you were young? The, like, that was my favorite, actually. So you, you were given like four colors, and you hide them, four different pins. You actually have eight possible number. You, you, you hide four behind, and then the other guy need to, to guess what are those four in this order. And so basically he would say, he, he would say red, green, orange, <coughs> blue. And you tell him, well you actually have one right and three are wrong. But you never say who's right and who's wrong. And then he will try another try, assuming one of them is right, and try different. And then you tell him, now you have actually zero right, and then he revisit his assumption and put another line. And you keep repeating, repeating, repeating. So th it's really hard to guess because the possibility of having eight colors. Huh? Eight colors, basically arrange it, but we actually pick only four. So that's not exactly this. But if we have only four color and we want to arrange only four of them, it will be factorial four. But since we have eight and we'll pick only four of them, we'll see what we'll do next. Right? So anyway, so if you have three, say, three letters and you want to figure out how you would arrange them, right? A, B, and C, it should be factorial three, right? Factorial three, six, and those are really, this is the three, or the six way that you can arrange A, B, and C. Okay? Does this make sense? Why it's permutation? Because the order is important. And here are the three and we are arranging all of them. We are not picking some of them. I'm not saying out of those uh, three letters, let's have two of them and they arrange them. No, we are picking all of them. Right? So we'll, we'll have actually three more cases. So now this is, uh, you have those N group in, in guys huh? and you want to arrange them basically in, in classes or groups right two groups for example say a box huh, containing uh, six red and four blue balls and you are trying to figure out how many ways you can come up with this arrangement right actually two of them out of the four so it's factorial of n that's the whole the total number over n factorial 1, n, n1 factorial, n2 factorial, nc factorial, and those are the different classes or different group that you would have. So that would make actually it make sense if we read this example. So in a box containing six red and four blue balls, the probability of drawing first red and then a blue ball, so one red and one blue, is, and so the, the probability is one over the number of possibility. So to, to draw one red and one blue, that's one case huh, of different cases. And so the total number or total way you can arrange those on in group in two groups is basically this. Factorial n, that's the total number. And this is the number in the first group and the number in the second group. So 10 over factorial 6 over factorial 4. So when you do this, factorial 10 over factorial 6 over factorial 4, you get 210. <coughs> there are 210, then you can arrange this. So the probability of getting one of them is 1 over the 210. Right? Does this make sense? This is actually the most difficult one. The second, th it will get much easier in the third and fourth case. So you're saying th there's, a, there's an order to this? Like we said, oh, first red. Yes, there's an order, right. So the 
permutations was the 10 factorial over 6? Say that again. Which one was the probability and which one was the permutation? <coughs> this is a permutation. It's which is, in this case, the total number is 10, and the first group is 6, and second group is 4. But here, he's basically saying what is the probability of having one of those cases. So he's dividing 1 over this. So that's why it's inverted. But that's basically the number of permutation of these things taken all at time. So n group, so n total, and it's divided into basically two or multiple groups. Okay. The number of different permutation of n different things taking k at a time. So out of the eight colors, let me just pick four of them to play that game. Well, I have eight choices. I just want to pick four, and I'm trying to figure out how many ch how many codes I could write using those four. Okay. So before, when we were taking all of them, it was factorial n that was taking all of them. Let's arrange the whole class. You'll get factorial n. But out of those 63 students, if I just want to pick five students, okay, and order is important, how many com what how many combination or how many permutation I could have, naming the first and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth best student in the class, it will end up being this. So what is that formula? It's factorial n but divide over n minus k. All right. This is without repetition and this with repetition. Okay, but still order is important. That's why it's permutation. So you should compare those two guys huh, with the two formula that we had earlier for the combination. This was also n, and you were taking k, picking k mm -hmm. out of them without repetition and with repetition. So you had this binomial coefficient here, binomial coefficient over there. And then when order is important, of course, the number would increase, right? Because order is important. A and B become double. It's also A and B and B and E. So you get this and you get this. So what, so what is the difference between this one and the one without with, uh, equal classes? What is this one? So this is... Uh, all those guys are different. There are eight okay. colors. Okay. And you are trying to pick... There are eight individuals. And you are trying to pick four of them. Okay? Four of them, and in, in with order, order is important, and you mm -hmm. are picking four of them. All right. And so how many combinations? How many combination? Um, so like. How many permutation? Because order is important, and this one doesn't have repetition, and this one has repetition. Let's read the the example. Actually, will explain much better. So if we read this, say in an encrypted message, the letter are arranged in group of five letters. So. He used five letters to make words, basically, right? Every five letters are used into to make a word. We have a total 26 letter in the alphabet. And every time you make a word, you make five of them. You are picking five out of those 26. So to start with, is that permutation or combination? Should I go back to the combination or order is important? Because it's a word. It's not a sample that we are sending to the factory next door. So order is important. So you immediately tell yourself that's a permutation. Order is important. All right? And you are picking huh, from the total population. You are picking five. So you are on this page. Now the only thing is, should we consider repetition, repetition or without repetition? Is he allowed to make word out of A, A, B, C, D, or no? You can only have A, B, F, and N, and X. And you cannot repeat the... With repetition. I mean, so he actually, uh, he did it two ways. So he say, uh, this is with repetition, because sometimes you will use the same letter twice. And so with repetition, it's N, K, 26, power 5, and that's what you get. All right? And if you cannot actually, if the, he's saying the word containing each letter no more than once, basically saying you cannot repeat, then you will just use this formula. n factorial over n minus k. n factorial over n minus k. 26 over 26 minus 5. So again, what's really hard about this problem is to find the formula that would 
describe that that event all right n factorial over n minus k factorial all right so let's see this example so how many permutation for tossing two fair dice so it's it's really important that he said permutation because without saying that i would actually take this as probability combination i mean what is i mean i'm throwing a two dice i will get if I'm playing a game, if I get 3 and 2, it will have the same impact on me if I'm having... Exactly, right? But he said permutation, so let's, let's do a permutation, right? And, and it's basically two fair uh, dice, so each one of them can actually give you uh, 6 chances, right? And because repetition is allowed, we could have we could have basically the same number appearing twice on both of them. It's n to power k. So n to power k. 6 to power 2. Alright. There are 6 number. There are 6 number and we are picking 2 of them because we have 2 dice. So, so, it's so, a, so the population the population is 6 and we are picking 2 numbers out of them. How many permutation we could have? So this the only difference between, like in this example anyway, between a permutation and a combination is that a permutation says, uh, it labels, okay, die one, die two. Right. Say die permutation one, six, permutation die say two, die one and die two, one. correct. Whereas okay. combination... Whereas combination would wouldn't really would be care. Half of that in this case, wouldn't it? I mean, like no, not half. We will just use the formula. Well, I mean... Right. You, d you don't have to guess. We will just go to the combination and say, well, repetition is allowed. It's this one. We we'll use n plus k minus one over k, right? So n would be six and k is two, right? So it would be what six plus two minus one. It will be five and two. So you can calculate this. So five and two would be five four over two. So it's five times two. It's ten. Ten. Right? And over here, it's thirty-six. Right? Did we do this right? So where's repetition? Yes, it should be this. So 6 plus 2 minus 1 over 2. 6 plus 2, actually that's 8 minus 1, that's 7. 7. 7 and 2. It should be 7 times 6 over 2. Wait, n is 6. N is 6 and k is 2 and minus 1. Minus 1 is 7. 7 and 2. So it would be 7 times 6 over 2. So it's 7 times 3. It should be oh, 21. That's the, formula. that's the formula for the combination. Well, yeah, but like when you said uh, where you said, okay, so down in your purple, say 3 plus 2 minus 1, and then you have in brackets 4, 4 and 2, I thought that was plugged back into equation 4a. No, it's plugged back in this. But, I mean... This was repetition, and this was out repetition. I'm just not seeing on the, on the page where you have, like, n times k over factorial. Energy. So let's let's agree on something. This is those two formulas for combination, right? Yes. Okay. One of them is without repetition yes. and one of them with repetition. When we are throwing two die, huh? Mm -hmm. We are allowed to have repetition. The first one could say three and the second one could also say three. So definitely we should allow repetition. We should use this formula. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Correct? So so this is the formula we are using. What's n and what's k? n is the total population, mm -hmm. and k is how many we are throwing at a time. The total population we have is the faces of the die. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. How many we are pulling out of that population? 2. 2, two die, because we are throwing 2 die. If you are playing risk, you throw 3 die, if you are attacking, right? So that 4 times 3... So, 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 so this should be 6 plus... 2. 2 minus 1, which is 6 plus 1, which is 7. Mm -hmm. It will be 7 over 2. Yes. 7 over 2. So 7 over 2 would, would be what? 7 over 2, the way we write it is? Seven factorial. First factorial 2 down there, and that number repeated twice. Oh. So it will be 7 times 6. 
So that's 7 factorial over the 2 factorial? If you want to say 7 factorial over 2 factorial, then you have to add this factorial. And that's, I don't like it this way. So what is that 4 times 3 over 2 factorial? That's, that's Wait, me. Let, me, let me explain something. Okay. This formula, huh, doesn't have to do with, without, or with. This formula is a way to calculate the binomial combination. It's basically the binomial coefficient. <coughs> mm -hmm. This is a way to calculate this, A and K. It doesn't matter why you're calculating this. The way to calculate this, huh? 7 and 2, is to do this. You divide over factorial of that number, and this number is repeated this many times. There is another way to calculate this using using this formula. This is another formula to calculate this. This and this are equivalent to each other. All right? Well, you, you, let's discuss this after the class. Everyone get it? Except for Shin. <laughs> I'll take this out in the recording. <laughs> Leave that in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not nice. All right, so. We, we can do it again. There's more example. We can do it later. But basically, again, huh, what's important is, is it permutation or combination? And then is, is repetition is allowed or not? Right? And so, yes, permutation is important because he insisted on calculating the permutation for this. Okay? Otherwise, this process doesn't yield itself really to permutation. It really yields itself more to combination. Right? Combination with repetition. Right? But no, we will go with this, and because he said repetition is okay, then it's n to power k. Questions? Right. We are ready for chapter 20. Chapter 25. All right. So, who heard about Gallup Park before? That's very important in election Gallup years. Park. Yeah, it's very important <coughs> in election year, and they they became famous when they predicted really the 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 election of one year of the presidential election, and they they picked basically they all not just predicted the election correctly, but they also said how wrong the the other method was. And the other method, basically, they were used to call people by the phone and ask them who's going to vote for. And so it turned out who got phones. Only, basically, a certain population has phones. And so they were ignoring the rest of the population. So, basically, the point was that if you really want to assemble a population, you really have to have a very random sample. Right? So if we want to, basically, say, ask uh, the students how you are happy with uh, with this campus, we shouldn't really wait until it's 10 o'clock and uh, people are leaving at 10 o'clock and ask them, so how do you like our campus? You have five minutes? Do you have five minutes to chat about our campus? The population need to be people leaving at four and coming at four and leaving at seven, right? You have to have it really random. So that was the first lesson. The second lesson is that out of this whole population, huh? if you only call five people in, or talk to five students out of the whole population and you get their average and you get their standard deviation or the variance this x and s square is it really the is it really the actual average and the actual standard deviation of the whole population no because you didn't get a very large sample so how large is the sample compared to, so and there, it, this is not just we are being stingy on our effort and we don't want to spend the time calling everyone. No, sometime, huh, for example, we are making uh, rockets and we want to figure out if the range of the rockets basically, as we claim, 10 kilometer or not. We cannot find every single rocket to prove that it's 10 kilometer, because then at the end of the day we don't have anything to sell. Yes, our average was perfect. All our rockets fire at 10 kilometer or higher but we don't have anything to sell. So sometimes you are just restricted by the fact that the sample size will never be the population size. And so now we have to establish a way to basically have confidence level in our 
results in our average we need to basically say yes the average is I mean we the 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 products we are making it can really take whatever 900 gigapascal but plus or minus and here's our plus or minus okay so how are you gonna do this so first of all this is the formula huh when you have the raw data you know that by now for x and this is uh, the formula for the variance if again you have the raw data all of them all right so what we will get huh is basically the average and the variance of the sample i'm gonna call the in this chapter the book basically called the sample standard variation standard deviation s and he called the population sigma so when you see sigma that's the true standard deviation that's the actual the one belong to the population the whole huh, population and when you see s that's only the five data point that you collected what is the standard deviation All right so the the average that we calculated from this formula is an estimate of estimate of the the actual mean right this is just an estimate and that s huh, is an estimate of the actual sigma correct that's what we said right now that out of this population here is five this is their x bar and this is their s square and the question is what is the relation between this x bar and the mu and what's the relation between this s and the sigma are they the same or a little bit different right so we will make this uh, concept it's called the confidence interval that this is actually very important this probably will show up in the final I love this problem and I, 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 I also need to show that to the ebit that you guys can actually calculate this so that's why it will probably show up in the homework this week so there are two numbers over here really there is this gamma over here standing over here that's the confidence level when I say was in 95% confidence your average the thing that you are measuring the height of the students the income of the family the what is the bounds of this so that I am 95% confident that the number will never go outside those guys all right so the problem will be he will give you the confidence level he needs he will tell you with a 90% confidence level and you would ask about those guys this actually there's no number this two numbers there's only one number there is symmetry here it's plus or minus the same number okay it's plus or minus five plus or minus seven so we are after this plus or minus okay we want to figure out huh exactly it's kind of the tolerance of the data within that confidence level okay very good so over here in the slide he basically trying to say that if you increase your confidence level to say I won't know within 100% confidence level what is the pound on my average so that the average is 100% sure that the limit is minus infinity and infinity so within 100% it's everything so that we are never wrong right we can never really be wrong so we tell them it can be anything then we are never wrong but as, as you boil down this huh and I remember when I was a student, my professor used to tell us, we are 90% lab. If we think, if we both think within basically 10 plus or minus 10%, we are okay. People don't expect more than this, we are fine. All right? Because it, it costs a lot of time and effort to actually build your confidence level. But some application require this. All right? You are making an airplane. huh? You cannot basically say, this airplane is safe plus or minus 90% will tell you will sell you 100 airplane 10 of them will crash <coughs> that's horrible right 10 percent right but some application you know they would expect 10 percent right so gamma is a confidence level and the table that we will use would sometime would require basically either gamma or one minus gamma so one minus gamma is then if 95 percent is the confidence level then one minus gamma is the probability of being wrong basically right you are 95% confident 
the average is within this limit, then for 5% of the time, you will go up outside this range. You will be either higher or lower. Okay? Again, 99% confidence level, that means there is 1% chance of being wrong. And this guy will leave this. All right? Very good. So the problem would be typically this. You will be given x1, x2, and xn, and he will ask basically for theta1 and theta2 within a certain gamma. So gamma will be given, the data will be given, and you will basically come up with this. So it's actually, the formula is very easy. What people miss in the exam is uh, the difference between this problem and the problem, the next problem, where What's the difference between those two problems? Th this one, we actually know sigma. Mm -hmm. We know sigma, this is not the sample. The sample it was S. Remember, sigma is the actual standard deviation of the population. So that's the difference between those two problems. If you actually know sigma, you there is one way. If you don't know sigma, but you know S, that's another way. So how could you know sigma? Well, huh? No, it's like a re have been tried before, and, and you know, th there is this spark plug, you know, factory, and this thing, this mesh process has been certified, and we didn't change anything, and we always come up with the same standard deviation. Huh? Or we will already have uh, all the, the population of Tulsa, and they know that the standard deviation in all those things is basically plus or minus whatever. Right? So you already did a lot of comprehensive search before that you are pretty sure what <coughs> the sigma is. Right? And so, what you will be given again, the either the raw data, huh? you'll be given say 5 and 4 and 3.2 and and so let's say there are four points like this, so you'll be given the n and the xi, or huh, directly you'll just be given x bar and n, the average. Either way, if you are given just the raw data, you can come up with the x bar, right? And divide over n. And you'll be given also sigma, right? And what does he want from you? He would like to see what are the plus or minus. So the confidence level, uh, within 90, he's, uh, the 95 percent also is given. It will tell you within 95 percent limit, what is uh, <coughs> the interval width. So <coughs> the true mean, mu, would be within x bar that you calculated, minus k and x bar plus k. And then the only thing that's missing is that k. What is that k? Right? And this is the key. And so you need to mark your book where is that key and where is that stable. Because that's how you can uh, calculate the key. Is that a sigma on top? Yeah, let's read it. So the key is a C. That C will come from the table. Sigma, that's what's given. We know the sigma of the population. Divided by the square root of N. What's N? The sample size. The sample size, exactly. N is a sample size. And C <coughs> is coming from that table, and sigma is the, st is the population sun division. Where is this equation? Did you see it? It should be on page... 1069. Huh? 1069. So mark it with a box or something. If it's not this... It's it's marked with a box. Already the box? Okay. It's important. You need to find it in the exam. So C sigma over N. So now the only question is, what is C? Huh? How do we get it? And you have this table. And so that's what happened in the problem in the exam. Students will go to the other table that we will explain later and get the C or come to this one for the second problem. So you need to make sure that when sigma is given, you use that table. When sigma is not given, but S is given, we will use the other one. So, what is gamma? That's the confidence level. Remember? <coughs> confidence within gamma. 
So if he said, was it 95%? So I come here and I read C as 1.96. Alright? And this will just basically multiply by sigma over square root of n. So I mean, look at this formula. Does it make sense? So k is C sigma over <coughs> square root of n. So the higher the confidence level, if you want to be 0 0.999, look at what happened to the C. It shoots from 1.9 to 3.2. I thought C is the number, isn't that just standard deviation? C, at 90%, at no, 90%. no, C is basically coming from that table. It's just the value from that table, and it's function of gamma. And that C will increase as gamma increase. So if you want to be 90%, confidence level, C is 1.6, but if you want to be 99.9, .9, C is 3.2. And see what this do is, it make the gay bigger. It basically gives you a bigger range. So rather than reporting that here is my average within plus or minus 4, you are saying, no, this is my average plus or minus 7. Because you are making the key bigger. Yeah. Right? And also look at this, the n. As n get bigger, not only at 4 data points, you have 40 data points. Yeah, so the key will drop. Or the limit basically of the confidence level gets smaller, meaning that I am pretty sure the average is 40. Because not only did I did four points, but I did four hundred points. So increasing the n reduce the k. Decreasing your confidence level, huh? So that you don't mind being too much, a little bit wrong. That also reduce your k. Increasing confidence level if you want to pretty pretty, you know, you be pretty correct, and you want to go to ninety nine point nine percent. That push your k to be higher and higher. Right, and of course sigma. If the data has a smaller sigma, that means that they are pretty much sitting on the average. Right? And so that shrink your key. But if sigma is really big to start with, you're measuring the temperature and it's like one time is 20 and the other time it's 80 and then 20 and then 100. That make bigger sigma. And that basically make your average, you're not really sure where is the average. Isn't the, the, the C in that table, because this is for a normal distribution, isn't that just the f that's the factor to get 97 or 95 or 99 percent accuracy multiplied by your sigma? Isn't that the because at, at, at sigma equals two, it's 97.5, and at 95 you have not 1.96, and at 99 you have 2.576, and then where sigma equals three, you get 99.7, and that's 3.291. So is that the the sigma that you have to have to get 95 percent, like that constant? So you're saying your sigma times that factor gives you 90%. You said so many things wrong, I don't know where to start. <laughs> so, okay. one of them, I, I, let, let's not say the answer to you yet. I, I will introduce that concept in a second. This is a confidence level. It's different from the answer to you in the average. Well, yeah. So, there, there, is, there is uncertainty in the average. When you say that I would like my average, and that, that will be asked later. Huh? That's very important. When we say, I just want to know that my average is 10% accurate. That's different from saying I want the interval for 90% confidence level. Those are two different things. So as a matter of fact, I will ask you, and I did ask in the exam many times, was in 95% confidence level, huh? how many data points I need to make sure that my average is plus or minus 10%, plus or minus 10% of its value. So when we report to someone that the mileage per gallon of our car is 40, we just want to be plus or minus 10% wrong <coughs> of the mileage per gallon. So basically, if it's 36, they will not put a lawsuit on us. If it's 44, it's still okay. And we want this to be within 95% confidence level. So meaning that for every 100 car, we will be 10 times wrong. Sorry, 5 times wrong. Because we want to be 95% confidence. So that, that's the first thing. So uncertainty is different from the confidence level of the... So now, what you said was right, but this is a normal distribution. Yes, we are assuming a normal distribution. And actually, even the second problem that we will solve, when we say we don't know the sigma, yes, we don't know the sigma, but we still assume that distribution of the whole population is normal, right? Mm -hmm. So that's always in the back of our head. All those things are done for a normal distribution. Right? And I, I remember, you know, when I was doing my, I'll show you how, how is that related to uh, doing research. Like, 
I remember the one, one of my friends, well, he was Russian, and actually he came and he said, but you know, when you're doing this, you're still assuming it's Gaussian. The other method. And I said, yes, I know, it's still, we are. We have to assume Gaussian. What? Oh, I mean, we have no idea what the distribution is, so let's just assume it's Gaussian. <coughs> so yes, we are assuming Gaussian. Now, the third question that you asked, then, so what is that C compared to this? We don't care. Here is a formula to calculate the interval widths. Now, how did they come up with this? Huh? Let's leave this for statistics. All right, this is engineering analysis, not the course in the statistics. But of course, this has to do with the distribution. You're right, I mean, how did they come up with those number? It's basically assuming the distribution is like this, and of course, assuming that, let's get away of the tail, the 1% <coughs> and the 1%, right? This is just reputation. This table, 25, 1, that's the table that you will use if you know sigma, right? And you just want to know the average is plus or minus what? Okay? Plus or minus what, exactly. So the k again is c, sigma over square root of n, right? And the c is coming from this table. Now, if the, if the average, x average, huh, is like, hundred dollar that's our profit we are trying to calculate average every month or something and say the average is hundred dollar and the key end up being huh? 50 so that's make the uncertainty in our average 50 over 100 right it's 50 percent within huh? 95 confidence level if we solve this problem over 95 percent confidence level the uncertainty in our average is the key over the x bar. Is that clear? The uncertainty in the average is the key over the x bar. And so that's, that's a really very tricky part that students would miss. And it's plus or minus. And the uncertainty percentage Huh? It's plus or minus k over x bar multiplied by 100%. Right? The answer simply is basically the k that you just calculated. And again, that k will be different for different for different confidence level. You know, different confidence level would basically will bring different c and that will bring the k to be different. So within 95%, huh? You will put 196, but within 99.9%, .9 you'll get completely different key. So let's look at this example. So you want confidence level, 95% confidence level, huh? 95%. You have 100 points. The average is five. Whether he will actually calculate this average by giving you the raw data, or he will give you already the average is five, and sigma, huh? See the variant that he said the mean of a normal distribution with variance sigma square is nine, not s square sigma square. Then we will use this method. We are stuck with this method. So what do we do? We want when he ask about this, when he say determine a ninety percent confidence interval for the mean. He would like to know the mean is plus or minus what? The mean is sitting between what exactly? What are the limits? So he want, he want that 5 to be plus something and the 5 to be minus something. What is that something? It's k. What's the formula for the k? c sigma over square root of n. What's n? 100. What's sigma? 3 that was given. Because sigma square was 9. And what's c? I go to my table. What did he say? 95%? 95%. So it's 1.96. I bring it here and basically put 1.96. And I calculate this number. huh? And so I basically add it to the 5 and subtract it from the 5. It turned out to be 0.588. So where is the 95% confidence? My mean is basically sitting between 5.58 5.588 and between 4.412. Okay, plus, plus or minus. Plus the key and minus the key. Exactly. But you, you, you write it like this. You'd say the mean is sitting between those two numbers. And that's within 
95% confidence level. Okay? Very good. So, so I, I remember, you know, my, my first thing to do as a graduate student when they give me my first assignment and go and measure this, I wanted to know how many days I'm going to spend measure this. I didn't mind basically working forever, but, you know, every time I do the experiments, like $2 when we assemble, basically it costs $2 for each picture. And so I wanted to know how many I want. He wants me to do it. And so he, so he told me, you are the one that will tell us basically how many we need. All we need is 10% uncertainty. So you go and tell me how many we would need. And they give me the statistics book to go and find out. So, again, the number. huh? So that's why I'm saying my first task is a great student. Find the end. Such that the, the interval huh, is plus or minus the average, 10% of the average. So when we finally report the thing that we measured is this much, huh? kilogram, for example, mm -hmm. we are not off more than 10% in our results. So how do we do this? How we find the end? Should we do 100 times or 1,000 times? Or should I spend my life, you know, getting 10 million points to get it right? How can I determine the end? Like solving for n. So the n exists in that formula, right? K, C, sigma over square root of n. So to come up with that end from this, we need to know K, C, and Sigma. Right? Mm -hmm. So C, how do we get C? The table. The table. And so once we basically say, what is the confidence level we would like to have? Right? And most people run at 95% confidence level. Okay? But if you work for like a calibration institution like NIST or something, sometimes those people would run at 99%. But 95% is good for engineering application, most of them at least. You ask your boss what he wants. Okay? I'm gonna not going to double uh, check your boss. So, with a 95% confidence level, we know the C and we know the... And we know the sigma, right? Why do we know the sigma? Because this method, assuming you know the sigma, we will know later what happens if we don't know the sigma. They, don't, they did those measurements before, they know the sigma. So, the only thing standing between me and getting the n is the k. If you give me the k, I will calculate the n, and they will tell you you have to do it 40 times, for example. How can I get the k? Um, that's that's the, that's the, that's the no. divided by 2. Yeah. Get, the k get what? You add, to, add or subtract to your average to right. give you the... So, what is the l? So that's when it say basically 10% of the average. So basically when you run the calculation a few times, huh? five times, this is kind of a pilot study, and you figure what is the, uh, what, uh, what are we measuring? How much is it? 100 kilogram? So plus or minus 10%, that basically mean it need to be 10 kilograms. So you already established what is the K, roughly. And so you bring it over here and say, so to get K to be 10, I need this much n. Of course, as you start, at, so it turn out that n is 50 data points. So you add 50 data points. Now the average will be a little bit different from the 5 data point that you started with, right? You work your number more accurately now. But that's how you estimate before you even start the, the measurement. You have to start with few numbers or few data points so that you can come up with what is the key you are trying to shoot for. Right? And the same philosophy work if we don't know the sigma. What if this is a new measurement no one done before and we don't even know the sigma? Uh. Same idea. You start with few data points. You get a feeling of the average and the sigma. And you then figure how to do the calculate, how many that need. But when, when you don't know the sigma, we don't use this formula. Okay, when we don't know the sigma, there's another formula that we will use in a second. All right? But it's the same philosophy that to come up with the n, and those, this is really a nice problem to have, actually, in the final or the homework. 
if I ask you basically for the number of data points and not the straightforward problem which is here we measure 10 times here is the average the sigma give me the the intervals this is a little bit more uh, so what you were saying there is to get your K you use this formula over here and it breaks down to the L your L is equivalent to your mu what, what is the key? The key is the plus or minus that you add to the average. How large you want that key to be? He said, the customer, the boss, the manager, he said 10%. We want our measurements huh, to be plus or minus 10% of what we report. So if we are, if that mu is 400 kilogram and you want to report it within plus or minus 10%, the key should be 40. You got your key. What if we said, no, we want to report our results plus or minus 5% or plus or minus 1%. You need to know what are we going to report. You are estimating it because you didn't measure it yet. You are just trying to figure out how many data points we need. But you get estimate basically how many data points huh, will get measured by basically first running a small data assemble, 5, 6, 10, and come up with roughly what is the mu and then roughly what is the key that will make this process 10 percent and once now you have your key you can come up with an estimate of the end and then it turned out to be 50 data points you do your 50 data points you come up with a new average you come up with a new key and you go here and check huh? if the key was actually plus or minus 10 percent or not right Right, so obviously, as, as you lower, as you want to lower your L, huh, or the, the range of the, of the error, huh, the number of data points increase. It increased to the, to the extent that sometime, basically doing this calculation, huh, you did 40 times, and you calculate the uncertainty, and the uncertainty, based on this, it turned out to be 50%. And that's horrible, 50% is horrible. But then your boss say, no, no, 50% is not uh, acceptable. Let's go again. Let's have another round. You you actually, before you go to another round, you have to figure, so how many will it take, how many data points will it take to actually go to that 10%? And so if it turns out that it will take 10 million, and that's like 20 years, I mean, obviously that particular process will not be able to be measured within 10%. And you will just have to be happy with 50 percent, right? Because as you can see, as the number, as the, the length in decrease, as you want to shrink the uncertainty more and more, it takes forever to go there, right? So this is huh? This is nothing but but this formula. N is k square over c sigma, right? Sorry. N is C sigma over K square. If you bring N over here and you bring the K over there, it will become C square sigma square over K square. It's simply just bring N. It's like this, right? And the K is N over 2. Huh? And so that, that's what you are looking at over here. The N is 2 sigma, 2 C sigma over L square. All right. Now, here's the second problem. So that's the second category. When we don't know sigma, we only knew S. All right? So basically, give you the data points. <coughs> so this problem would be something like this. You will say, here is the uh, data points. and calculate with a 90%, 95% confidence level the, the interval of the average with a 95% confidence level. He just gave us the data points. So obviously we don't even know the sigma. All we can get is what? I mean obviously n is 5. I can get the average. I can also get the s. Excellent. And that's when you know that I cannot use that first method. We have to use the second method. All right? The second method is not really 
complicated. It's just another formula with another table. That's all the difference, right? Wait. So first of all, <laughs> first of all, here's the table. The table get a little bit complicated. So it's not just one. This is table A9. Huh? Table A9. And it's called T distribution. And it's also called the student distribution. Right? And the The, the guy actually who came up with this worked for a very famous beer company, Guinness. He used to work for Guinness, the Irish beer. And so he was trying to come up with a statistical model for basically something has to do with the beer. And the, the competition at that time was like really fierce between beer companies. And so they wouldn't allow him to publish his results actually. And he tried to convince them that this is just pure science and the competitor wouldn't really benefit that much out of this. And But he basically came up with that distribution. All right? So that distribution, all right, is basically what we're going to uh, replace our C in the previous table. So where is the formula we're going to calculate with? So... Here is the formula, huh? So the within the 99%, 95%, whatever percent he gave us, huh? <coughs> we still are trying to calculate mu plus or minus k. We are after the k, right? The only difference now is that k is not packed by a sigma, it's packed by an s. That either you calculate it yourself out of this, or you actually are given that s. But it's clear it's the s, it's not the sigma. So the formula is K is C S over square root of N. That's exactly like the previous one, except that rather than C sigma over square root of N, it's C S over square root of N. Alright? So we will just put the S with square root of N. The only difference now is the C. Alright? So what is that C? So that C huh, is function of of course, the confidence level like before, but it's also function of n minus 1. n minus 1, that's the data points, minus 1. Huh? n is the data points, so if we have, say, 5 data points, like in this example, n minus 1 would be 4. <coughs> okay? So, you come to this table, the t distribution. And so when I was a student, graduate student, we all had this table basically on, on our desk. Everyone basically had this table in front of our desk so that we would pull the number out of it. And so we are after the, the C. We just won't get the C that we want to we wanna put it there. All right? So how we can get the C? The C is actually those numbers. So how do we know the row and the column? This is actually the N minus 1. So if we have the five data points, I should pick which column? Four. Four. If we have five data points, the n minus one would be the four. All right? And I guess that's what's confusing over here. So this guy is uh, half one plus gamma. Okay? Actually, this is really not really nice of them because the one that the book that I use when I was a great student, this was actually marked for us 95, 99, so you don't have to do this calculation. But So what we have to do is, so for gamma 0 0.95, this will be 1 plus 0.95, and then 1 over 2 of this 1.95, you will end up with 0.975. That's for gamma 95. And for gamma, say, 99, it will be 1 plus 99 over 2, so you'll end up with 0.995, right? So it's not a convenient, but anyway, once, just that I'm going to give you 95% uh, confidence level. So maybe you should mark that line. <coughs> That's the most common line. And so now all what's missing is basically just which column, depending on the number of data points. All right? So if you give us gamma, we use the bottom. 
So those are for different gamma, okay? And, and this is w not just gamma. It would have been nice if it's gamma, but it's actually 1 plus gamma over 2. Okay? This is 1 plus gamma over 2. So that's why when gamma is 95, when the confidence is 95, you should use 0.975. So that's tricky. Yeah. <coughs> but then once you put your hand on this, huh? that row, all you need to know is which column. And that column is the number of data points. You did 11 data points, you should use 10. You used 9 data points, you should use 8. Correct? This is always n minus 1. And as you can see, as the number of data points increase, the C drop, 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 drop. All right? So obviously for uh, one data point, if you only were given one data point, if you measure this thing once, someone told you go and measure the temperature in your house, and you measure it only once, can you do any of this? No. You can't. You at least you need two data points. Right? So at least two data And then with two data points, look at the uncertainty or the, the C that you are picking from the table. 12 compared to 2. Right? So that's why I have three thermometers next to each other in the house. And that's why my wife thinks I'm crazy. But you need to have at least three data points to, to be able to... Uh, to believe the results, right? To do any analysis. Oh, right next to each other? Well, in different, uh, <laughs> a little bit farther away from each other. <laughs> but you, but you need you need to be able to do any confidence level analysis. You need at least huh, three data points so that at least you drop from twelve to four point three, right? I mean, look at this: sixty-three to nine, big difference. All right. So let's let's finish with this example in the next three minutes. <coughs> and, and so that is the typical example that you would see in the exam. So five independent measurements of point of inflammation. He's trying to figure the flash point of diesel. You know, they basically heat it and first find out when he will start flashing. All right. And so they get five measurements: 144, 147, 146, 142, 144. Assume normality. That means it's Gaussian distribution. So that's why this table is still applicable. Both of them is assuming Gaussian distribution. And determine a 99% confidence interval for the mean. 99 confidence, that means that we we'll use this row. Right? When gamma is 99, 1 plus 99 over 2, it's basically this row. Okay? And how many data points he got? Those are 5. So n minus 1 would be 4. He should basically get 4.6 for his C. Correct? 4.6. So, yeah, C is 4.6. For n minus 1 equal 4. And see, look how he's calculating the half 1 plus gamma. So that he can use that table. And he got his C. And what is the formula he will use now? C S over square root of n. But he, he first have to get the S. How you calculate the S? We have the formula for the S, right? The standard deviation? Yes, Sean. This is going to sound like a stupid No, question. there is no stupid question. Well, what's the, what is sigma and S? Like, what are they? Cause that's I, I a, that's a very important standard. question, and that is the question that will send half the, stu half the class to get a 4, huh? and the other half will get 5. And actually, no, 3 and 5 in the exam. Because if you pick the wrong method, I'm not, I'm not going to give you 4. I'll give you 3. If you pick the wrong equation, that means that it's not the right equation. So sigma is the standard deviation of the population, the true population, the whole population. And not just the 4 or 5 data points that you measured. Those guys will have an S, will have a standard deviation of the sample. So unless you bring all the diesel oil in the company and you burn all of it huh, to make sure that this is the sigma you are measuring S so just think of S as sample and that's an excellent idea S stands for sample <coughs> sigma stands for Gauss that's it you solve this for us if you see S it's a sample when you see sigma that's the Gauss distribution 
<coughs> right? So because we have only five data points and we calculated the S on our hand, he didn't say here is a sigma of the Gaussian distribution. We are bound to use this formula, which is exactly the same except that the C is coming from different table. <coughs> right? And so he calculated the C, right? As uh, square root of S. So it's square root of S squared, which is S. That's why it's S squared is 3.8 out of the formula. And that's the square root of S. Multiplied by the C, divided by the square root of N. Not N minus 1. N minus 1 to go to the table. But when we come to here, it's N. All right? You come up with this number, it's 4. And therefore, your average is... You actually can create the average too out of this. It's 1.44.6. Then you would say my average was a 95%, sorry, 99% confidence level is the average minus the k and the average plus the k. That's it.